so. Well, it's good to be with y'all this morning. Good to see you. Um, I've uh, enjoyed visiting this class uh, some in the last couple of months and uh, uh, look forward to being part of the rotation now. So I get to uh, to be with you um, in this role for the month of September. Um, so it's a long time since I've taught from the uniform lesson series. So the, the curriculum has changed some since then and um, it's kind of uh, uh, interesting and different to step back into to, um, to looking at a, a curriculum on a specific text like this. I'll, I'll introduce myself briefly. I think I've, I've been introduced briefly before, but we haven't all, always heard the, the same words. I go by Steve. I'm Steve Scott. I'm a um, retired pastor. Um, I was uh, uh, actually, I, I was mentioning to Louise, I, I met Tom as long ago, Tom Norwood as long ago as 1976 when he and I were both pages to the PCUS General Assembly in um, in uh, in Tuscaloosa that year. Uh, the first two General Assemblies I went to were in Tuscaloosa and, Al and Birmingham. But, um, um, so so that, that may be my oldest contact with uh, DCPC uh, among those who are part of the fellowship now. Uh, Lib Simmons uh, has been a good friend of mine for many years because the next year uh, she and I became interns in the PCUS Division of National Mission at the same time. So we first knew one another then, and then we ended up in the Jacksonville area in our first calls after we graduated from seminary. So, um, so it's interesting uh, to, well, the Sometimes the Presbyterian Church seems like a small family, as you may have experienced in, in some ways. Where did you go to seminary? I went to Louisville Seminary, and Lib went to Columbia, of course. Oh, there you graduated from Louisville. Oh, did he? Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Wow, wow. Um, and then uh, Bill, I first met through, uh, through uh, his son Richard and family at, at Trinity when I was on the staff there uh, during the 90s, so uh, it's been good to to meet him again, and um, I enjoyed catching up with Richard a few months ago in Atlanta at um, a Board of Pensions event there. So let me ask you all to introduce yourselves briefly. Um, I'm still working on learning some names, so uh, uh, some I'm learning more than others, but uh, Louise, let me ask you to start, if, if you will. Okay. I'm Louise Norwood. Um, my husband is Tom Norwood, and he is spoken of, and um, we have been in Davidson since 1988. Wow. Um, Tom had been in Mississippi uh, pastoring churches and came here to work at Davidson. And we have been here ever since. And um, by, by trade, I um, help some raise our children, but I was also a clinical social worker that worked in the uh, Presbyterian Novant system for years until I retired almost nine years ago. So, and we love our community and the church and love seeing other people come in. And yes, we see old friends a lot that somehow arrive in Davidson. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Bill DeBose. Graduated from seminary in 1954, Union in Richmond. And they've been retired here since 96. I served four pastorates in uh, Laurel Hill, Neil Arnberg, Pulaski, Virginia. Rockingham, North Carolina, and Hart, South Carolina, and did one year of fundraising with the Bicentennial Fund, it was called it, uh -huh. the nomination of wide uh, mm -hmm. fundraising, and, and I worked for John Evans at that, he was oh, nice. the executive of, of the president, well, John and I, I was in their wedding, and, mm -hmm. you know, we go back to Davidson at Union Center. So. Good, good. 
bet you've got some stories. <laughs> I'm Tom Noel, N-O-E-L-L, -L, and uh, I didn't graduate from seminary. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, well, Carolina, maybe that's <laughs> <close>. <laughs> the, uh, we've been in Davidson about 30 some years. Um, I, uh, uh, we were Baptist, Southern Baptist, or now Southern Baptist in Charlotte for many years, and uh, we moved to Davidson and we finally moved our membership. We became Presbyterian and didn't have my golf bed, but <laughs> it was a nice idea. We've enjoyed this church. Uh, we've, we've seen it for a number of years before we were members of it. Uh, appreciate the outreach to uh, a lot of different populations in this community. So uh, we, uh, we're at the Pines now, and uh, that takes up quite a bit of our life now. That's good. I'm Carolyn Noel, um, and I was a teacher and counselor with the Charlotte Mecklenburg School System. Um, I do a little writing and um, enjoy reading. And one day, Louise Norwood told me she needed to talk to me. So she came <laughs> over to the Pines and we had lunch together. And I said, what's on your mind, Louise? And she said, I'm going to learn how someday in the future to grow old. <laughs> now, I don't know why she did it, but she did, and we had a good time. We did, and you answered everything that I needed that day. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit went before that meeting. So thank you. That's interesting, yeah. Sarah. <laughs> My name is Sarah Filling, and I am a retired medical records administrator, and I joined the church in 2016. I'm really living in Davidson. I don't think I realize you're as recent an arrival as that. So, right. Yeah. I'm Lou McCree. Uh, and I lived in Davidson since 76. Uh, we both grew up in Newton. North Carolina, which is up in Catawba County. Uh, we were Lutherans there and we came to Davidson and there wasn't a Lutheran church to be found in, in the area. <laughs> Coming to the Davidson College Presbyterian Church. We left a little bit when they formed the Community in Christ Lutheran Church uh, in Cornelius. But we had already made so many good friends and loved this church so much, we decided this is where we ought to be. So yeah. We've been here since 76. Mm -hmm. We have uh, two boys and five grandchildren, and Beverly and I are at the Pines, and our two boys and their families they are in the uh, Davidson Cornelius area. Right. That's a little, we, we envy people who have family close by like that. Um, and I should have mentioned too, our, our first real contact with, um, with um, well, we, we moved to Statesville where I was pastor for 20 years in, um, in 98. And, uh, and we brought our son, Will, who was 12 at the time to Davidson uh, for basketball camp that, that first summer here. And uh, he stayed in Belk Hall, and then when he was a freshman, he ended up at Belk again. So, so then he was um, was at uh, at the college and graduated in '08. So um, uh, he was especially active in musical ensembles, and we were frequently in the sanctuary as they had uh, per several performances a year. So, um, so so Davidson felt in a way like uh, coming home. Um, because of all those many contacts. But our landlord said, as I spoke of our son having been here, he said, well, you'll find Davidson has changed some in 15 years. And that's the truth as all of y'all can tell too. So let's, um, let's jump into our biblical text. This is one I hadn't read in a while. And I look back and you know, there are a lot of things. There, there are many scriptural texts on which I have preached many times. And I, 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 um, I hear of, of, uh, some of our uh, minister uh, 
cousins in some denominations who might be called on to preach on short notice and could just stand up and start talking. And I have ordinarily required more preparation than that, so I never felt like I could do that. But still, there are some texts I've preached on so many times, I'd be able to have somebody to say. But I found looking back that that this particular text is not in the lectionary, and I don't think I've, I've preached on some similar or related texts, but not on this. So this is Luke 11, 37, 44, and I'm going to read the whole thing because I know um, we don't always have our quarterlies uh, right in front of us, and it's um, it might not be totally fresh on your mind. So I, I will go ahead. So Jesus, while he was speaking, a Pharisee invited him him to dine with him. So he went in and took his place at the table. The Pharisee was amazed to see that he did not first wash before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? So give as alms those things that are within, and then everything will be clean for you. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and herbs of all kinds and neglect justice and the love of God. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love to have the seat of honor in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves on which people unknowingly walk. Let me ask you, any first responses how does that strike you was that was that a text you were familiar with before or does it seem like a lot of what he had to say about pharisees from time to time what strikes you about the text anything come to mind well, the church does some work with and i think another one of the sessions coming up this fall with how to talk with people with whom you disagree mm -hmm. jesus broke those rules <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, and I, I don't remember exactly what the text was, but a couple of weeks ago in Peter's sermon, he was he was citing um, Jesus saying some words like this, but then went on and and this was um, this was a, a new thought for me. He pointed out that shortly afterward, Jesus spoke to the um, Syrophoenician woman and said not to that the, that um, that it was wrong to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. So so you so that's another example of that. And I, I thought Peter's um, um, sermon on that had some interesting thoughts. So that in in the Gospels they did not always show Jesus Himself in the best possible light. Later on they tried to clean it up some, or or we do, but. Um, um, and, I, and I remember reading a feminist interpretation of that at one time that said that woman's coming back at him may have influenced him and helped shape his ministry um, from then on. So, um, um, so it's it, the church certainly teaches that Jesus is without sin, but um, but yes, as, as you say, he might not always do what he says we should do. Um, so why does the Pharisee invite uh, Jesus to dinner? Some people feel that maybe Simon invited him to dinner so that he could disprove Jesus' mm -hmm. saying. And so there was a little bit of hostility to begin with. Right, that it, there, there may have been suspicion behind the invitation to someone prepared to find out his, his, um, his worst fears about him or to have something to hold against him. Um, or on the other hand, it could have been that he found the things he was saying interesting and, right. and saw everybody around and right. really genuinely wanted to get, or maybe not genuinely, but wanted to get to know right. him better. I think that could well be. Yeah. Um, I'm remembering um, uh, in John, as you recall, uh, Nicodemus comes to see Jesus to to learn more about what he um, has to say. And, and Nicodemus later um, turns out to be, if not one who followed him literally, but he was a friend to Jesus to the extent he could be in his position. 
Um, so yeah, interesting thoughts. Um, so, so Jesus says the Pharisees are concerned more for outward appearances than for um, a more important spiritual reality that they can share and help others understand. Are there ways in which we become guilty of the same sort of thing, being concerned for outward appearances? It's probably easy to think of people who've known over the years who weren't best representatives of the faith in that way. Um, and, and maybe in, in a church like this, we, we, we know, many of us know not to leave ourselves wide open to criticism on that score. We can, we can be, we might have some thoughts like that sometimes, but we can also be self-critical and catch ourselves thinking that about, um, you see here people being, looking down on people who didn't come to church dressed well or something like that. And we, most of us have grown enough to know that's certainly not what it's about. Um, um, some different things come to mind to me over the years. I remember when I was in high school, our youth choir was going to do one of those youth musicals, such as became popular in those days. And in those days, it was controversial that we were going to be using instruments other than the uh, organ and piano, and that there were going to be drums in the sanctuary. And, and I remember our church's DCE at the time was really disturbed that we were going to be having a rehearsal on Saturday morning when um, the wife of um, an elderly retired minister was going to be held in the, in the sanctuary that afternoon. And at the time, I'm afraid I could be a bit of a smart aleck sometimes in those days. But I, I, uh, but I remember thinking that it was as if she thought the sound of the drums would still be echoing in the sanctuary four hours later or something like that. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's funny what people grab hold of sometimes. And we, we can think of other people who do those things wrong that way. So, um, but you can probably think of things that have disturbed you that where other people seem to have made a lot of something that, that really isn't very uh, important. I would wonder what um, 20 or 30 years from now, if you ask that question to people, what they would say about us. Because if you look back, you know, the church has evolved and right. many, continues to <laughs> many ways. And I think it will keep on right. evolving. Right. Um, and we know in some ways, some changes have been disappointing in that it's not as popular to be active in a church as it once was, to come to worship regularly, whatever. And we can think back to the, the stereotypical time is that in the 50s, everybody went to church and um, it was the only show in town on Sunday mornings, things like that. Um, one of the things that, that encourages me for the church generally is that I see some enthusiastic younger leaders who don't think of the 50s and the early 60s as because they don't have that memory, they they don't know what it was like in those days, and so so they they sort of accept things as they are and are, are willing to deal with the challenges as they are, rather than to um, waste time on regret about why isn't it that way anymore. And and I say that as someone who who can express those feelings as well. But uh, but there there's some. There, there's some enthusiastic younger people who give me hope in that regard. Um, what are some of the things that might apply to DCPC in a way that wouldn't be true for some other churches? The, the, this church has a distinctive role with its history that goes back, what, nearly 200 years, and then the connection with the college. Um, the college and the church have been examining their own histories over that time. And we realize 
it's true for any of our churches that it isn't always something to be proud of. And uh, so some of that speaks to that the concern for appearances in some ways. Um, at a meeting of Charlotte Presbyterian in, in February, I heard um, Sonia McCauley Allen is the pastor of Bellefontaine Church. And she talked about going to one of the churches in Charlotte Presbytery where there are still in the sanctuary, I guess in the balcony or the gallery, there are still iron rings embedded in the floor where the chains of slaves brought to worship would be attached. And she was, and a black woman remembers that history in a different way from how I do. And, and for her to show awareness of it um, is enough to uh, give some of us some sense of shame. I know in, in, in my former church in Statesville and before the Civil War, there were slaves who were members of the church. And then I guess the, the Northern missionaries who came in led the, the freed slaves to form um, new churches where they could uh, feel freer than continuing in the same role as as before but um so some of that applies to both davidson college and uh, dcpc as we remember some of those things and then as i think about my own family history um we've become aware of some of those things and and i have an interest in in trying to atone humanly speaking so uh, uh and make things a little different um anything particularly applying to, to this church that you can think of that might make it a little different from some other churches we've been members of or have attended. I think this church is welcoming to people from the LGBT community. And I can imagine that this church was farther along the path than many others are, are offered such a welcome sooner than, than some churches would have. Um, some have been later to get there, some aren't there yet. So we, we seek to correct some of what we become aware of that um, wasn't what we were open to. I think what I um, really appreciate about this church and about other some other Presbyterian churches I've been a member of is that there are still people that struggle with that mm -hmm. but they have been able to be um, still a part right. and, and, and know that we are a group of people that still have differences in the law, right. but that we are um, trying to follow Jesus right. and, and those examples. And, and I'll be stumble and fall. <laughs> right. And I'll be honest and say I was slower to accept some of that, partly because. Uh, of the ecclesiological reason, because I knew we were so far from consensus that I thought if we adopt this change, what will it mean to say goodbye to a third of our membership? And that's about what has happened for our denomination as, as we have assimilated the change and, um, um, and decided as a denomination, this is what it takes for us to be faithful, even if not everyone is on board. Yeah. So that's um, that's easier said than done. So, um, yeah. Well, I want to uh, step back, uh, thinking about the background of this um, and, and some of these things we, we, even in the times I have been here, we've commented on, but I'm thinking about how we have these stories of Jesus written down, probably a couple of generations after the actual event. So a commonly accepted conjecture for the date of the Gospel of Luke is that it was written around 80 AD when in round numbers, uh, the Jesus was crucified in 30 or so. Um, 
the city of Jerusalem fell to the Romans in 70. And some some speculate that um, that with what happened to the Jewish people with the uh, crushing of the revolt, that that was what gave a sense of urgency to writing down these things that people remembered that Jesus had said. Um, for a long time, they that didn't seem to be the need. They they told the stories, but as you recall, um, from things Jesus said, they understood that the end was near, so they didn't feel the need to, to do that. Uh, there's, I, Jesus says in one place, there are some standing here who will who will not die before they see the kingdom of God come, and and uh, people thought, well, that means that means me and. Um, but so there was Jesus um, teaching. Then there's the time of people telling the stories by word of mouth. And in some Christian communities, you know, one story got told one way and a little differently than in the next. And, and so the specific gospels uh, began to be written down based on a particular community's understanding of the story of Jesus. So the gospels came later um, uh, in that way. That's we. we touched on that before, but it's something that I think is worth um, reminding ourselves about. Another thing scholars point out about um, these stories sometimes is that in some ways, um, the way the story is remembered, the way the words of Jesus are recalled, may reflect the situation of two generations later more than it does his immediate time. So, so that some of the, the way the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees could be played up in a different way or emphasized in a different way because of the conflicts between Christians and Jews that were emerging more and more. Um, as we know, all the, all the Christians were Jews in the first place, but as more and more Gentiles were brought in, those uh, differences became sharpened and, and uh, uh, so that may have reflected how, how how they told and, and remembered these stories. Uh, another thing I'll touch on, and some of you uh, could lecture on this, I'm sure, but I'm thinking of the, the different Jewish groups in the time of Jesus' ministry. Um, there were the Sadducees. We hear, hear him talk about some. You may remember that the New Testament points out more than once that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Um, the Sadducees were especially the, the temple party. They, they sort of were uh, dedicated to things the way they were. They also, for the sake of preserving the temple, they kind of wanted to get along with the Romans and others like that. Uh, the Pharisees were bigger on ritual purity, such as we see in this story. Now, I've heard it suggested before that the, the Pharisees tended to be wealthier because you couldn't be as particular about uh, keeping all those laws uh, to the last uh, if you had to get your hands dirty doing some kinds of jobs. So, so it might might have been easy for a Pharisee to look down on someone who, who did things that would sometimes involve him or her in, in becoming ritually unclean. Uh, the Essenes were a party who thought the end was coming and their way of dealing with it was to withdraw completely. So they formed separate communities such as where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. They were they wanted to preserve themselves uh, uh, pure until the end came. And then there were the Zealots who were the revolutionaries who, who wanted to take up the sword and, and bring down the Roman Empire. And they thought that if they overthrew the Romans, then the Messiah would come because this is to might involve a bit of caricature, but um, but then the Messiah would show up on his white horse and lead them to the final victory. So 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 Jesus was ministering in a, a culture that had all these strongly held different opinions uh, vying for popularity and uh, and a lot of them would have found reason to criticize Jesus. Um, one of Jesus' disciples is mentioned as being a zealot, but the zealots were uh, probably uh, found Jesus disillusioned that he wasn't telling people to 
take up their swords and fight. But then when the when that time finally came, the Romans crushed them. So what later scholars say then is that the irony is that looking back, Jesus was probably closer to the Pharisees than to any other of the parties because um, he, um, he, he cared very much about um, what the, uh, the prophets taught and then also because he talked about the resurrection as the Pharisees did. So, so um, uh, you may, may remember in Acts when, when Paul is on trial before the council, uh, he sensed an opening. He said, I'm on trial because of the resurrection of the dead. And that got the Pharisees and Sadducees on the council uh, arguing with each other. So, um, so those are some of the things that, that colored that background. Um, I didn't bring it, but um, a, a book I bought a few years ago, uh, but I, I consulted it for the first time since I've had it. There's a, the Jewish Annotated New Testament. There are some Jewish scholars who have become quite um, knowledgeable about the New Testament. One of my grad school friends uh, was uh, Jewish. He was a, a fresh Harvard grad. He, he came to... Uh, to Vanderbilt to get a, uh, a PhD in New Testament. And so he, he knows it is more about these things than I do. And then another became a, a Amy Hill Levine, you might've heard her name before, um, uh, was at Vanderbilt. So she and someone else edited this, uh, this uh, Jewish annotated New Testament, which has some, some interesting notes. Um, I was thinking one of the, the words the the study material talks about is the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and we can as we've talked about people who put more appearance more emphasis on appearances than on spiritual reality we can we can think of hypocrites we have known and it's possible we could be self-critical and think of times when others might have experienced us as being hypocritical putting too much emphasis on the wrong things. I remember when the Good News New Testament came out when I was in um, in oh, church youth group or whatever, we started using that. And I, I was annoyed that it translated hypocrites as show-offs. And I thought that was kind of insulting to our intelligence because we knew what a hypocrite was. We didn't have to say that a hypocrite was a show-off, but, um, but that's among the the words being applied to the Pharisees um, in this case. Um, some say about the, the Jewish culture that there was a great deal of emphasis on purity versus impurity. Um, well, it, it's true that there was that there was that. So 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 that's why a Pharisee considered it important to wash the hands before um, before sitting down to to a meal it was and that wasn't for hygiene that was for ritual cleanliness I, I guess it was like baptizing your hands before you um, before you ate a meal because you were um, uh, not as pure um, a Pharisee was rendered impure by contact with a corpse well a, a Jewish person was so if it was necessary to touch a body then it was necessary to go through ritual cleansing uh, before becoming uh, pure again you may remember in the parable of the good Samaritan Jesus talks about the the priest and the Levite who passed the the uh, wounded man who lay there dying but they passed him by because they thought he might be a corpse and they would be rendered impure and unable to keep fulfill their duties in in jerusalem the the study makes the point that the pharisees themselves spread impurity by their being so zealous uh, about laws of, of um purity and impurity but not about the weightier things such as justice and righteousness. Um, one of the things this um, uh, Jewish New Testament pointed out in, in the notes, the uh, in our reading in verse 41, so give as alms 
those things that are within, and then everything will be clean for you. Alms here goes back to um, the Jewish word is um, um, righteousness, tzedakah in, in Hebrew. So it's give righteousness, not just give a few coins in an offering, but, but, uh, but to make amends, to do justice in society, that that's what's more important than the, the ritual purity. Um, let's see. Now, um, as, as I said, some interpreters look, looking back say Jesus was closer to the Pharisees than to these other dissenting parties. Um, we tend to have the traditional Christian view of Pharisees is negative in a way that has fostered anti-Semitism because we, as we have interpreted the Pharisees negatively, we have imputed some of that to our Jewish neighbors and, and sometimes in societies where there's a great deal of overt anti-Semitism, you can think of the worst, it's led to, to people's deaths that, um, that there ha has been a failure to recognize kinship we have for all the actual differences. Um, as you know, in, in the Gospels, there's a lot of Jesus sometimes is negative about Sabbath observance, and he points out instances of where, where there was a failure to be righteous about the Sabbath. If you fail to, to do mercy to someone who is suffering on the Sabbath, Jesus is critical of that. So that has given Christians a negative view of how Jews keep the Sabbath. Um, there was a book that I first, I think it was a feature in the New Yorker, then it came out. Um, a non-Orthodox Jew was spending time with, um, with Orthodox Jews in New York. And the revelation to her and to me as I read it was how the Sabbath is such a joyful observance for faithful Jews. So they, they celebrate that they get to stop working. They enjoy the time with family. Uh, they go to great trouble on, on Friday to prepare the Sabbath meal that they have after the Sabbath comes. And um, so if, if you've ever seen the play or the movie um, Fiddler on the Roof, you get some sense of that as the, the mother does the Sabbath blessing over the candles and they sing about the blessing they pray for, for their daughters, that sort of thing. So, so we have the view of Judaism that sometimes comes out of the Gospels has, has not let us see what is positive about um, a traditional Jewish observance. I remember I asked one of my Jewish teachers at one point some question about this, about the why these rituals were so important. And he said, and, and this would be true of that time, two generations after the time of Jesus, he said, after the fall of the temple, when the temple fell, uh, the daily offering of sacrifices ceased. He said, for, for a faithful Jew, the, the family table, the dinner table, became the altar. So that's why they put so much emphasis on all these customs having to do with the table. That's, that's what replaced the temple, which is an interesting thought, I think. Um, one of the questions um, the, the study suggests is for us to imagine what it would be like for Jesus to be at our table. Um, some families pray as a blessing, come Lord Jesus and be our guest. May this food to us be blessed. What would that be like for Jesus to come to our table? Just um, Think of the fuss we would think over him. Think, think of how it might uh, alter the way we typically talk at a at a family table. What would you, what 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 can you imagine? What might be the impact of having Jesus actually as a guest at your table? might be more accepting 
of what goes on in my larger family when we get together than I am sometimes. Uh, that's an interesting <laughs> thought. Right. Um, because you would banter back and forth. Uh huh. That's an interesting thought. Right. Um, the family table can be where all the family dynamics for good and for not so good play out. Um, you know, some families try to make a point of having a positive atmosphere for children and teaching children manners. But <laughs> both Laurie and I recall how the things our fathers would come down hard on about table manners. Uh, so, so Flory will quote her father saying, too big a bite, too big a bite. And, and uh, I remember my father seemed to be that strict about not keeping your mouth closed when you chew, stuff like that. So there, there are things, I mean, there are things children have to learn. Uh, and they do become memories. And then, you know, we recall that as we, tried to teach our children table manners. And then as we observe our son and his family and as he teaches them. And uh, um, so it's, um, so yes, imagine Jesus as being part of that. We might imagine that he would be gentle and caring, but um, um, accepting too, as you say. Um, so yeah, that's that's challenging. Right. And challenging, but I I just don't see Jesus um it might cut to the quick when he says stuff, but he's not disengaging right. from us. Yeah. Not not pushing us off to the side. Right. Um now think of the atmosphere families try to create, we know that um, some families always eat in front of the TV, which seems sad and it would be difficult to, to teach manners that way. We, um, we, we made a point of doing that ordinarily as our children were in the house um, and, uh, and, that, and we didn't allow phone calls to interrupt supper, though they recall in retrospect that sometimes I let it happen to me, and I guess you know, as a pastor, I always thought it might be something important or urgent, so I probably answered the phone sometimes when I shouldn't have. But um, but our children gave, went on to give us such a hard time because after we were empty nesters, we often started eating in front of in front of the yeah. TV. So so we we uh, we would do what we had. Uh, try to teach them not to do for the longest time. We 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 don't always do that, but sometimes. My father's admonition was: eating is an art, not an industry. That's uh -huh. that's a very interesting line. Yes, I like that. <laughs> and and uh, I think Jesus would have been would have had laughter as he came. I think you're right. He hung out with people sometimes. Oh, right. So they were very interesting and fun. And, right. And I think that would have been a big part of his being. Out. Right. Well, and, and just as I said, uh, faithful Jews find joy in the Sabbath and in the Sabbath meal. Um, that probably, that's what he would have brought as well to, to uh and table fellowship was an important part of the disciples' memory of their time with, with Jesus. So, uh, yeah. Um, and we think of, um, well, I, I mentioned this um, uh, grad school classmate who um, got a PhD in New Testament, and then he became a Reconstructionist rabbi. And he really has some expertise in all this matter of um, uh Food, customs, eating, dishes. I, I see some of what he posts online. It's really interesting. He's written books about it. But um, but so much goes into our our customs of eating. And, you know, we in the South grew up thinking of Southern cooking as the best. And there were, um, I always thought of my grandmothers as, as great cooks. And then with, with my mother's mother, she was, 
not as completely there as later. People, grandchildren would try to make conversation, ask her, and ask her what she liked to cook. And she would say then, oh, I never cooked. I always had a cook, which was also true that, that many had the experience of um, having good food prepared for them that way. But um, you know, this certainly applied to the South too, that who you ate with and who you didn't eat with was important. And that was a place where some of the questions of hypocrisy and um, authentic fellowship came into play. It certainly colored um, racial attitudes. And, and maybe I don't think of it as much as I used to, but I think after I became an adult, sometimes when I was at the same table at, with uh, Black people, I realized this was not always true for our people. So um, um, so it's the, our rituals came into who we would eat with as well as what we ate. And, and one of the controversial things about Jesus then was that not only did he not wash his hands ritually before eating, but he would eat with anybody. You know, he ate with the tax collectors and and uh, women with um, bad reputations and anybody else, us too. So um, one of the issues in the era of the church was that there were some, and I guess this went back to the Jewish background, who would not eat certain things. Maybe meat of clothing, hooked animal, right, and all uh, admonished uh, the Christians and Romans that uh, if what I eat causes one to stumble, who does look upon the diet like I do, and I will eat no meat. Right. Yeah. The the kind uh, a. Con Controversy in those days was whether the meat had been sacrificed to idols, and uh, uh, which might not seem like a big deal to us because I think he, Paul says that the idols represent gods that are no gods. There's no reality to it. But for people of weaker conscience who actually thought of the gods as other powers, to eat the meat that had been sacrificed to another god was like take, partaking of communion with that God. It was just as we think of communion as an experience of the presence of God. They thought that about their gods as well. Let's go back a minute and uh, see if we can think what the Pharisee thought after Jesus chewed him out. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Yes, he thinks. First of all, well, well, I wish I hadn't invited him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought he would have been. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, you know, if if we were confronted with something that we believed in, and uh, it it would be hard not to be defensive. Right. Well, and and as that they tell preachers preparing sermons, we ought to be aware of what's come before and what's come after that text. So after, as the as Luke continues after that, and the, the text we have I ends... I think that uh, the Pharisee, the host, did some thinking after. after right. Jesus left. Yeah, he I would may think have so. adopted something there. That, that's possible. When he got over being ticked off about him, cheering him out. Right. Well, and, and so so the text we read ends, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without realizing it. And, and to digress briefly onto that, to walk over a, a grave was to become uh, ritually impure too. So he's saying the Pharisees themselves are like graves that render other people impure simply because of their attitudes. But immediately after it, it continues, one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us too. And he goes on and starts talking about woe to the lawyers and, and talks about um, how they treated the prophets before. So, and, and then that section ends 
when he went outside, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile toward him and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So, so it may have sharpened the conflict, but I would think he probably might have opened some people to think he even do it. But, but again, I'm reminding myself of what I said, that some of this could reflect thinking of two generations later as these conflicts were being sharpened. So, yeah. Um, so, so I guess I'm, in Peter's sermon two weeks ago, he talked about it's not what, what goes into a person that, makes the person impure, but what comes out. So, th so this is related to that text, saying that the, uh, the inner attitude and how we reflect that and what we say and how we treat other people is more important than these rituals that we observe. So, um, um, Well, perhaps when you're confronted about particular spiritual or, or religious and you're confronted about what you believe my my bristle up real quickly mm -hmm. but when I get away and think about it I say you know maybe that's worth thinking a little bit right. about right and, uh, so being nice and sweet and uh, accommodating to everybody may not be the the uh, our right. greatest strength. So it's, you know, with all the controversies that affect churches now, uh, some experts in observing church life say uh, uh, we try too hard to suppress conflict. Um, dealing honestly and openly with conflict can help us get to a better place. And that's easier said than done, but we can, we can see ways in which it would be true. So. Yeah, I think the the meal was a good was a good uh, place to do it. You mm -hmm. know, right, right. I, we're not quite so good in our society at inviting people to lunch, particularly if they, you sense they're going to chew you down. Right, <laughs> right. The other thing is that uh, the juice spent the night. And don't worry about it. Like, come on and stay here overnight. Right. Uh, it's, and any of us that have traveled any, if you um, you went into uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, um, you're, you're staying overnight. You're staying in a in a Aaron bed and breakfast. Aaron yeah. 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 Aaron and breakfast. Yeah. Aaron a home where you're staying. Uh, but if you do that, you're in someone's home, mm -hmm. and uh, guess what? You're going to probably sit down and talk to them at some point. Carol and I were in England many years ago, and uh, bed and breakfast were good. Um, we stayed in the bed and breakfast, and the fellow there, he loved the challenge, and he would, he would. He would throw down the gauntlet if he got a chance. He thought that business should operate uh, for the uh, employees to have employment. And I kept saying, no, it's, it's, it's uh, to make a product or a uh, service as cheap as you can. Or as, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, that, was, just, that was the kind yeah. of thing that you, you run into. If, you won't run into that in any five star hotel. But right. The, uh, bed and breakfast is sometimes very interesting. Yeah. Anyway. I haven't done much of that. It's, um, uh, I, I, I did think of a bed and breakfast where I stayed in Scotland when I was on sabbatical years ago. The, in the, the proprietress, um, it, it, I guess it was like a small inn, but it was technically a, a bed and breakfast. But she called all, every guest she called my love. It's kind of sweet. So. Well, let's uh, conclude. And um, uh, I, I haven't looked far ahead to 
to next week, but you can give thought to that as well. So next week is, um, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? I refer to that as um, a controversy we're familiar with. So we'll uh, see, we'll continue some of the, the, the theme overall is, um, let's see, uh, faith that pleases God, and uh, it says unit two profiles in faith. And then September is um, love completes, law falls short. So again, that you know, I, I can think of a critical perspective on putting it that way because it, it reflects the generally negative Christian view of the law. And I'm thinking of how different the Jewish view of that is. They think of law not as law like the criminal code, but laws uh, teaching that um, uh, how we please God. So well, we'll close with a prayer and um, I'll look forward to being with you all again. And um, um, Louise, good luck with second graders. Yeah, I will miss y'all, but I will pop in and out <laughs> during that time. Right, good. Well, let's close with a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the instruction, the teaching we can continue to receive from your son, Jesus, as we ponder his words and consider his interaction with other people, as we imagine him as guest at our table. We thank you for this class, rich, rich heritage of study. We pray for those who could not be with us today, for those who might be traveling. We pray for all those for whom we feel particular concern. We ask that you will remember John Ryan's mother and, and John as he is of support to her during this difficult time. Be present with healing and strength and faith and everything they need. We pray for your blessing upon this congregation as, as people gather for worship and teach us to enjoy your presence with us not only when we worship, but always. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Good to see you. Thank you.